Accessibility in web design is very overlooked and it's something you should take seriously. Don't just assume that everyone is going to be able to understand, interpret, navigate and work with a website that you put out there for yourself or for a client as easy as you can do. Everyone is different and we need to start respecting that. And we did a video a short while ago over top 10 tips for website accessibility, especially with web design. But I want to share some images over here that are from the UK Home Office. They were done quite a while ago. However, I do think they are very relevant. There will be a link if you want to go and have a look or get hold of the original document. But what they've done is they've started looking at different conditions and how we need to think a little bit more methodically about how we can ensure they are easier to understand and use for them. First thing we're going to look at is the autistic spectrum. So here are some of the things you shouldn't do. And you can see on screen here. So if you want to just quickly flick through really quickly, you can do. And the link is in the video description. Don't use too many bright contrasting colors. There are things like color brightness that can trigger certain behavior. Just dull it down a little bit. I'm not saying go for complete grayscale, OK, but just dull it down a little bit and don't make it too bright. Try and make sure you keep your language quite plain as well. Don't go and use, you know, flowery, waffly words, okay, that are very difficult to understand. And that is something I must say I do see quite a lot. I have seen some websites, hero banners, where they're being very artistic with their wording. And I often say, just say it in a really simple way. You know, keep it short concise and to the point. Don't go for big blocks of text, okay? I know when you have a blog post, you might go, well, that's just what I got. Try and break it down, paragraphs, spacing, bullets, images, not just for stimulation, but also don't make it difficult for them to comprehend and understand it. Keep your buttons descriptive. Don't make it difficult to understand with, well, should I go here or not? I've seen some people using what looks like a button to almost be like a divider and someone might start clicking on it, but it's not a button, but you made it look like a button. But at the same time, make it clear where that button goes. Sometimes people put stuff like see more, but it doesn't really relate to a blog or an image. So you kind of go, well, what am I seeing more of? So keep it descriptive. How many of you have ever considered the fact that there'll be some people using screen readers? You know, they may have difficulty seeing the screen or they may even be blind as well. So please consider the fact that you have to accommodate that audience as well. This is where the alt description I've mentioned in my previous video about web accessibility as well. Make sure your images have a good description. Don't just stick an image in that has image X, Y, Z, one, two, three, four, five, whatever because that's what came out of your camera or your phone or you downloaded it from a stock photography website. Go and give it a description. So if the website shows a cat looking at a butterfly, put ginger cat looking at a blue butterfly. Just make it a little bit descriptive. We all love to add a bit of a wow factor to our websites. You know, we want to be a little bit different and funky. But consider the fact that if someone is using a tab button or the screen is recording out, try and keep it in a logical order. So maybe you've got like a header, a subheader, a description, then there might be images or a button. What you don't really want to be going from is like header, button, image, subheader, button, text. It starts to feel all over the place, especially if sometimes maybe you've got like blogs overlapping as well. When I mean overlapping, what I mean is you've got image and image and the images are for separate blogs. And then the description for blog one comes after image two. That doesn't make sense, right? Try and keep it in a logical order. And that ties into your semantic tags, right? Header one, header two text, you know, or header free, however you're going to do it. Try and keep it in order. Don't go for like header five is my headline. And then my subheader is going to be a header two tag. No, again, think about the logical way of building. Massive, massive tip when you're building is to actually view your website live and start hitting the tab button. Does it go through the navigation menu? Does it allow them to like tab and click an arrow to now see the drop down? Can you actually now hit tab and it starts to skip through the headers and maybe go along the images as well? Or have you built a website where you hit tab and it just like goes over everything? Like you've just gone and dumped a massive image on. All of your text is on the image. Like it's literally implanted into the image. So the screen reader can't read the image. The image doesn't even have an alt description telling you what the text was. So all they're going to get told is image. 
like what? So please bear that in mind because that is a mistake also I have seen on one page websites to go and drop in an image and the text is implanted onto it. Try to stop doing that. What if your issue is low vision? Well, okay, this is now where we're almost going to slightly contradict what we said with the autistic spectrum. So we said don't go for bright colours. In this scenario, you do. Now, this is where you have to be mindful of the audience that are most likely going to be looking at the website. So if you're working with a charity or someone who provides a particular service, bright colours with good contrast is key. Make sure you check your contrast of your colours with a contrast checker. We'll put a link in the video description. You got to make sure you're ticking all the boxes and getting green. Don't expect people to have to now start clicking buttons to download information. Make sure they can get everything they want. Of course, you could argue, well, why can't they download it? Because maybe they could share it with someone who could then read it back to them. But make sure that they can get everything they want on the screen because hopefully if they are tabbing it and, you know, zooming in as well, they get what they need. Did you know that you can get particular fonts to help people with dyslexia? Images and diagrams are great to convey what you're trying to say. Don't confuse people with too many blocks of text. That's kind of a bit of a repeated pattern throughout at the moment. Align your text so they always kind of know when something is starting. Don't always centralize. Now we are going to contradict a little bit because when it comes to links with web accessibility, they do recommend that you underline. However, if you have a feeling that there's a higher chance that your audience are going to have dyslexia, don't put them in italics. Don't underline because it can create some confusion. The next one about using audio or videos to convey what's happening is a great idea. And I would probably say that goes for people with low vision and uh, blindness as well. There are lots of plugins out there that allow you to zoom in and change the contrast. And, I, and apparently this is a great tip. I, I have to be honest, it's not something I would have considered, but they are recommending that letting users change the contrast of what they see on screen. I can't be the only one who's worked with someone who had a bit of a motor disability maybe they were struggling to use the mouse or click even click on buttons as well so what you want to do though is kind of remove the need for them to really rely on the mouse a little bit okay you do want to make large clickable buttons so even if they're able to just tab and click it that's great and even if they are using a mouse they're not having to like be very particular, which is why sometimes on some forms having like radio buttons or check boxes isn't always a great idea unless you make them really big. Let's imagine you're building a website where you're providing motility uh, equipment or uh, like electronic wheelchairs or something like that. Anything that's going to help these people have a much, anything that's going to help these people, anything that really helps these people out. And you've got a form because they need to contact you because they want to get the equipment, but you need to know their details. And you give them a form with 20 fields. Was that really, really fair? Could you have made it a lot simpler? What did you really need to know? And just remember, they're going to get frustrated if it's so difficult to complete. Now we've covered off visual impairments, but what about if you are deaf or you're low of hearing? Don't assume that just because they can still read that they're gonna understand everything you put down there. So again, don't use flowery, waffly prose or, you know, wording. Don't make it so complicated to read, keep it simple. And if you are providing any audio or video, please do make sure that there is a facility for them to read that, like a transcript, or if there is a video, they can actually see the captions. Don't put a video on there where there are no captions, whether they're embedded or there's a facility for them to toggle them on or off. And any website where the only facility of contact is to like use like a telephone number is an absolute epic fail. You can put WhatsApp if you want because they could still write it, a contact form, but give them extra means of being able to get in touch. Don't just say call me because I see that a lot on a lot of websites, okay? Come on, think a little bit. Web accessibility, we wanna build websites that work for everyone as much as we can. But did you ever consider anxiety? And even I've gotta say, you know what? I probably didn't. So let's make that change now. Don't put timers on websites, okay? Re I see this so much and it annoys me. You go to a website, there's a product and it goes, you have five minutes to complete this. I kind of understanding from a caching point of view, or well, maybe they want you to purchase something, but I could almost then argue, well, just because I've put something in my basket, 
until I've purchased it. If anyone wants to beat me to it, fine. But think about putting timers on your websites, okay? Now, if you put a countdown to an event, so you say there's like two days to go or 10 days to go, well, that is okay. That's just a timer for an event or something that's happening. But don't make someone go to a website and like they're filling out a form and it goes right if you don't complete within 30 seconds this will now self-destruct or implode on you. Consider the warning messages that someone might get if they complete a form incorrectly. Can you maybe sweeten that up a little bit? Can you maybe take out the harshness that we get with error messages? And even when they do complete a form or they do buy something, can we give them that nice, warm, generous email or a message that say, hey, thank you so much. Have you ever considered why we sometimes do that when you purchase and then you get a thank you page? You might think, oh, well, I'm hoping it's gonna, they're going to go and buy something else. Yeah, there's a bit of truth in that. But at the same time, you want to kind of make them feel good as well. Maybe they were apprehensive about buying a course or a product. And, you you know, they were like, mm, do I, do I not? You want to now say, hey, you're in safe hands. We're going to look after you. An age old argument is, should you share the prices of your websites? I say yes, but you don't have to say the exact pricing because it depends on what you're building. But you could let people know though our starting prices for a basic website is X, for SEO is this, for maybe analytics or hosting or something it starts here. You don't have to be exact because your prices can change but where do you start? Because if you say to someone hey I can do X, Y, Z but you have to contact me and wait for me to get back to you, what if you don't get back to them for two days, a week? You don't know their state of mind and the fact that they are probably now going to be very apprehensive and suffering some anxiety. So give them some indication of what the starting price is. And if you are going to use a multi-step form, kind of give them the ability to go back over what they did or see a summary of it before they submit. Because if you have step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and they're all on different screens and you get to step five and you can now hit submit, but they can't go back. So even if they can't see a summary, but they have a button to go back to previous, and even if they go back, 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 forward, 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 all of the information stays intact, you can do that. There was a lot to go through there, and you're not going to completely agree with anything. And I've just taken some slides that were produced by the UK Home Office, and I would say definitely explore what's happening in your country. Think, uh, Go and speak to other web designers go and check out forums as well. We can all do our bit to make websites much more accessible for everyone. I'm Imran Web Squadron. I hope you like, subscribe, share and follow and just have a think a bit more about your designing. See you soon. Never break, always fight, never quit, do it right, play the game, win it life, have no shame, there's no time, feel the pain, with the grind, I could change, in my mind, pick a lane, commit and climb, the only way, to win it life, I never miss that fact, taking big swings, bitch, hand me the bat, put me in the ring.